Good morning. I'd like to talk to you about a 28 gigahertz 5G FEM. It's a single chip I see in an SMT package, something we designed for one of our clients. So, short introduction. The full details of 5G are still in development. However, there is a lot of work going on implementing, designing and trialling 5G systems. We've been undertaking a continuous stream of funded 5G work for the past two and a half years and it's still ongoing. What we do know about 5G is that we will allow for much higher data rates, extremely low latency and hopefully uniform coverage over a wide area. It's also intended to encourage the deployment of innovative uh, new applications, new markets, and it will. What you find is that once the wireless data capability is there, someone will come up with some idea for making use of it. I, I recall when 3G was about to be launched, everybody said, well, it's going to be the killer app to make use of all this data. Nobody's saying that now. People are just saying, oh, no, a 3G link, that's rubbish. I really could do with a, an LTE link. And 5G will just take it to the next stage. To get this massive increase in data rate, we'll need large chunks of contiguous spectrum. And a key part of 5G will be the use of millimetre wave spectrum. Now, millimetre waves were previously considered useful for line of sight propagation, but a no hope for no line of sight. However, there's a lot of work being going on, done now in metropolitan areas, various studies that have shown that the issues can be addressed and it is practical to implement non-line of sight millimetre wave propagation. Now, you still can't go through concrete walls, but there are things you can do. And these things largely rely on some form of beam steering. And we've done work for a, a large number of people, and they're all doing it in slightly different ways. Some people are using uh, conventional um, electronically steered phased arrays. Modest number of elements, obviously. Some people are using switch beam. But in all cases, there's some form of electronic beam steering. What frequency will we use? Well, this chart here shows some of the key bands. In actual fact, it's only in 2019 when the actual uh, legislation will come into play. But the FCC has licensed bands at 28 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, and 39 gigahertz. More recently, the uh, Radio Spectrum Policy Group of the uh, EU decided on 26 gigahertz band. We've done paid work developing 5G components in all of these bands. So, you know, no one's agreeing on the band. Later this year, the US will auction some of the 28 gigahertz spectrum. The UK won't be far behind as soon as they decide that they can get a decent um, chunk of money by auctioning it off away it'll go. And, and we'll see what will happen. Um, it's a great opportunity if you're involved in developing new products because no one's really sure and no one can afford not to back the right horse. So this is the FEM we, we designed. This is all on a single chip. It was realized on a 0.15 micron E-mode PM process. Uh, that means positive control throughout, positive bias and everything. <clears throat> We've got a three-stage PA. This was operated in class AB because our client was specifically interested in uh, best performance, best PA at um, an IMD product ratio of minus 35 dB. And that amounted to about 7 dB back off. I'll show you some measured performance. We've got a PA enable circuit here for fast switching of the PA. There's an output coupler. I'll show you a, a, a chip photograph next, and it'll be a nice, crisp, clear photograph. None of these data sheet photographs where they blur everything so you can't see what's going on. Uh, there's a power detector, temperature compensated power detector. 
a TR switch at the output, and to be honest with you, it's, it's not a walk in the park to design a 28 gigahertz SPDT on a, um, a PM based process. Then on the receiver we get an LNA, and that LNA had to operate with good noise figure, good linearity, and without using very much power. There's uh, an LNA enable circuit here, there's some switch control circuitry or on chip. You've got a little current sense resistor here to allow you to set the bias of this LNA. And this uses a stacked bias arrangement. So we bias from four volts here at the output, reuse the current in both stages. So you've got two volts across each stage, and this helps us keep the current down. Um, both the receiver and the transmitter are biased from a plus four volt supply. This is a photograph of the LAC. This is the common port output here. Over here is the PA input. Here is the LNA output. And you see these wireish pads here, so we've optimized the width of those pads as part of our design of the transition. So this IC is going in a conventional overmolded plastic package. So it goes down an old QFN plastic packaging line. What we did do is we designed a custom lead frame to optimize the performance of this. And we designed the transition from this bomb pad through the bomb wires, through the lead frame to the PCB on which it's mounted to get good performance at 28 gigahertz. All the measured results I was showing you are for the IC soldered onto a PCB. So they include all of the parasitics that you'll get in the real world. So the LNA, sorry, the PA you come in here. This is a little network to do um, a frequency compensation to get a flatter gain versus frequency response. This is the input stage transistor, the output stage transistor, the, the driver stage transistor, two power combined output transistors. The selection of the size and bias of these transistors is key in order to get any best linearity from the overall amplifier and best efficiency. If you make the driver stages too small, they'll start to compress early and the overall linearity of the amplifier will be degraded. Make them too big and you degrade the efficiency. So it's a balancing act that takes time to do. This is the TR switch here. We've got inductive compensation in there to allow it to work up at the 28 gigahertz band. You come out here, a little bit of matching part of the switch. You see we've got two capacitors here rather than one shunt capacitor. That's to help with the ESD performance of the IC. Then down the LNA here, source peaking in both stages to bring the point of best noise match closer to the point of um, conjugate match. And these, some little bits of control circuitry here for the um, switching, first switching control of the LNA and the switch. And this is the package part, packaged in the Far East. Um, incredibly cheap to put them in a package, but you do have to work hard in order to get the RF performance from that package. And the packaging house in the Far East, you do this sort of packaging, they're only interested in working with people who are going to go to sensible production. So, you know, we, we had a, a big partner who was funding us who, who it was it enough to get them to work with us, but if you want 50 or 100 uh, parts packages, they're not interested. <coughs> so this is the common output here. This is the PA input here, the LNA output here. This is a, a TRL calibration tile we designed as well. And so all of the reference planes of the measurements are to the center of this line, which happens <coughs> to be the port of this package, because you'll see this is slightly narrower than this. This um, material here is Rogers 4003, 8 thou thick. You need a thin substrate, mainly to keep down the inductance. Very important to have the induct low inductance when you're grounding these ICs. Your inductance is too high, you'll end up with a, an oscillator rather than an amplifier. And we stuck them to these metal carriers here mainly for rigidity purposes, to be honest. It also has thermal in course, but the main reason is for rigidity. Here's some measured results. 
in all of these plots, the dotted traces of the simulation. So you see, we're, we're actually very slightly higher in frequency. And as it, this is everything. This is that package part includes all the package effects soldered down to the PCB. And very good input return loss across our band. We were, we, this part works about 26 to 29 gigahertz or so, uh, slightly wider than the 28 gigahertz um, FCC license band that we were targeting. But you see very good return loss, better than 16 dB all the way across. This is the output IP3. And what we've done here is we, we've measured it at a number of different tone levels. And you can see they all lay over one on top of the other. And they have IP3 spell plus 28 dBm. This is a, a plot showing the simulated to measure up IP3. It's a little bit different, but, but not about tiny. And this shows the performance at 1 dB compression. So the transmit strip has about 20 dBm output power capability at 1 dB compression and 20% PAE. And this is for the PA plus the output power detector coupler plus the TR switch and all the packaging effects, the molding compound and the transition to the PCB. Now, this is what our, our clients were interested in, which is the performance with an IMD of 35 an AMD3 of 35 dBc, which translated about 7 dB back off. And this is what our design efforts went, went towards, um, optimizing the performance at this level of back off, which necessitated going to quite a deep class AB uh, bias, whereby you then trade some small signal gain. And we achieved well, well, you can see it's 13 dB because it's 7 dB backed off from P1 dB and about 7% PAE. This is the power detector. It's temperature compensated. So we have a reference diode on there and a detector diode at the output of the coupler. Take the difference between the two and on a log scale you get this nice linear um, voltage versus the output power. This is the receive strip. See, the noise figure is uh, this measured noise figure. Uh, it gets simulated, pretty good agreement, and it's about 3.3 dB around that sort of level. And the gain, a little bit more ripple than simulated, uh, about the same sort of level, about 13, 14 dB. And just 4 volts and 10 milliamp bias, which is pretty good for a 28 gigahertz amplifier. This is the receive path to compression performance. So about 7 dB and P1 dB, but a very high IP3, up at 21 dB. Um, in honesty, it surprised us we weren't expecting it to be quite as high as that, but um, we will take these things when they come to us. And those are all the plots, uh, performance plots. I have got a few conclusions. So, the FCC license band at 28 gigahertz is one of the key candidate bands for millimeter wave 5G. And I think it's the first one where we'll start to see deployment. There are already plenty of companies announcing we're rolling out 5G. They're not, because the standard's not been set. They're rolling out what they'd like to be 5G. <coughs> we developed a single chip FEM, comprising LNA, PA, TR switch, on chip power detector. All of the control circuits required for fast switches are off. And we've popped it into a 5 mm by 5 mm QFM package, over molded plastic. Performance of the soldered parts on a representative evaluation PCB, I've shown you. Just summarise those now. The transmit path, uh, P1DB of 20 dBm with about 20% PAE. When you back it, off by 7 dB to get that 35 dB uh, IMD3 ratio, you're at a PA of about 7%. The receive path gain about 13.5 dB, 3.3 newton dB noise figure. Current consumption just 10 milliamps from 4 volts. And the receive path IP3 is about 20 dBm. 
If anybody is interested in more information, April issue of Microwave Journal, it's the cover feature, there's tons more description of what's going on in there, but I'd be happy to try and answer any questions that anybody may have.